grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So we are officially halfway through a sermon series called 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. You might recall two weeks ago, we kind of set it up, our soft launch, where we, where we made the case that these two things, prayer and fasting, not only go hand in hand with one another, but are also important spiritual disciplines that we, at least most of us, I think, have kind of lost contact with. Now, we might be tempted to say in that moment, well, I, I pray, or I sit in church, and you pray, or Jared prays, but, but that other thing, that fasting thing, and its connection to prayer is somewhat lost in our current uh, day and age, and so we're, we're trying to reclaim this process, this, this thing, this gift, that God gives us for our good to help us grow closer to him, to carve out a new kind of pathway of discipleship in our brain so that we can narrate our life around the gospel, this important news that Jesus Christ came and died for all of us. And so we have been cruising for the last couple weeks, two weeks ago, kind of the soft launch last week. We kind of got into it a little bit. Um, Today, we're going to keep going and for the next couple weeks, but as we pivot today, uh, it seems appropriate to stop for a second and to to look at what Jesus has to say about prayer. Did you know that Jesus speaks about prayer? That's not a difficult question, y'all. It's actually a pretty simple question. A nod, a blink, something to let me know you're still awake, alive, with me. It happens right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, this big sermon that Jesus gives in Matthew's gospel, or at least Matthew records this big sermon that Jesus gives that we call Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus begins by talking about our relationships with others, what it means to seek reconciliation, to to care for the poor, to give to the needy. Jesus begins this way, and by the way, he ends with a similar thing, talking about the fruits that are produced in us by God and by God's grace. But right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Right in the middle of this giant section of teaching that Matthew records for us, Jesus stops in Matthew 6, and he teaches us to pray. Here's what Jesus says. I think these words will be familiar to you. Pray then like this, says Jesus. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Are those words familiar to you? Of course, right? That's a, a substantial part of what we know as the Lord's Prayer. This beautiful gift that Jesus gets us. Because, see, one of the challenges of prayer is that we can begin to think that prayer is about proper grammar or proper vocabulary or proper whatever. We can fall prey to thinking that we have to, that we have to sound really profound and holy. We have to throw in a bunch of, like, God churchy words in order for our prayers to be heard. And yet here, Jesus says, listen, don't worry about all of that. I, I just, if you're, if you're confused about how to pray, if you're concerned about doing it right, I, I'll teach you the exact way to pray. Oh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And he goes through it. In fact, our confirmation families right now are going through the Lord's Prayer as part of our instruction to parents as they then teach their kids. And we've been working petition by petition by petition, uh, specifically this notion of our Father who art in heaven. How does the prayer start? It anchors us in who God is. Hallowed be your name, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are you noticing this trajectory of prayer? God gives us a beautiful gift here in teaching us how to pray. But it actually generates a question for me, and the question is this. Is it possible that we can take a good gift and we can mess it up? 
Can we take a good gift and misunderstand it or misuse it or blow it? Is that possible? I got a gift once. Some of you might recognize it. It's a little object lesson. Peter, you won't have any idea what this is. Ready for it? Do you know what this is? Peter, you're such a bright boy. Have any of you seen these things before? Do you know what this is? It's fun. I should have put a ginormous image of it up on the screen because right now y'all are squinting like, is it a phone? No, it's not a phone. It's a GPS. Do any of you have one of these? You had this awesome cord that you got to stretch across your car and that you inevitably like, had to then mess with as you sought to put your cup in the cup holder. Right? It's a kind of a cool gift, really. It's kind of a cool piece of technology. You can type in where you want to go and it goes. I, I especially like this one because this one, I, I have been on some pretty fantastic trips with this very GPS. Like, you know how it works, you get in your car, you heat it up, you do all that stuff, you check everything, you, you put the little suction cup on the windshield, pop this thing on there, you run your cord, we had paper clips to hold this out of the way so it wasn't in the way. You back out of the driveway, you start driving, you put in the address. I always took the shortcut and just press that home button and I would just drive and it would steer me right around the block <laughs> and right back to my house. It was fantastic. Actually, it didn't matter where I wanted to go. It didn't matter where my destination was. Every trip was exactly the same. I would get in my car. I would suction cup this thing to the window. I would back out of the driveway. I would start driving. I would press in the destination. Of course, taking the shortcut of just hitting the home button. I would go around the block and I would come back to my house. Fantastic way to travel, don't you think? I mean, that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to be home, right? It's where I was comfortable. It's where I know everything. It's my space. It's beautiful, GPS. Do any of you have a GPS like this? Does yours do the same thing, just route you around the block? You have it on you? Oh, you're cheating. I thought he just pulled a GPS out of his pocket. I was like, come on, man. <laughs> have any, do any of you take that same trip where you leave your driveway and you go around the block and you come right back? Why not? Would that be an appropriate use of this? Right? We all know that that sounds ludicrous, does it not? Because after all, if you want to go to Branson, you, you actually want to go to Branson. If you want to go to Florida, you actually want to go to Florida. If you want to go anywhere, you actually want to go there. You don't just want to take this thing and redirect it right back to you. That's really what's symbolized by your home. It would be ludicrous for us to think that every trip was focused on our little corner of the universe. And it is likewise ludicrous of us to think that prayer and fasting are somehow about us. That would be an abuse of the gift. See, the part of the text from Matthew 6 that I didn't share is the setup and the conclusion of Jesus talking about prayer. Jesus begins, actually, a few verses earlier in Matthew 6, verse 5, when he says this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you pray before you ask him. And then he says, pray like this, and here is the Lord's Prayer. What's the point on the front end? The point on the front end is, don't somehow take this gift of prayer and spin it so that it makes you look good. 
That's what Jesus is saying to the people in a day of kind of religious facade reality. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean where God's people pretended to be holy and pious and upright. They, they, they put on their Sunday best and they pretended to be good churchgoers, but the reality was church was just one more thing that in their life pointed to them, that drove them out of their driveway and right back to their home. Church, language, prayer were all things to be leveraged to make them look good. Sound familiar? It should. We all do it. We all do it in our various ways. Because most of us were raised in a church culture where we actually got social standing by being part of the church. We all got social standing by being good and pious and holy. Jesus says, don't be like that. Don't take this gift that I'm giving you and somehow spin it into making you look good. That's not the point. The point is focused on who God is and making him look good. That's why when you pray, you should pray our Father in heaven, center it on who God is. Hallowed be his name, his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is all outside of you language, not look at me language. This is all language that roots us firmly in a non-self way of living. That it doesn't matter if people know your name, it matters that they hollow your father's name. It doesn't matter that you get your way or your wishes, it matters that God's kingdom and God's wishes are what is accomplished. Jesus says, don't use religion to make yourself look good. It's not the point. Don't use prayer to make yourself look good. That, that's all before he even gets to the Lord's Prayer. And then uh, on the back end, Jesus comes out of this teaching about prayer and reminds us that if we forgive others, God will forgive us, but if we don't, we won't be forgiven. That's a hard teaching in and of itself. And right on the heels of that, because even Jesus understood the connection between prayer and fasting, and because Jesus knew our amazing ability to take a good thing and spin it towards ourselves, he says this, verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And he goes on to challenge us with the question of where your treasure is, there your heart will be, and thus the question of where is our treasure and our heart. Even fasting can be taken and can be twisted towards ourselves. We have an amazing ability to do that as sinful people, don't we? to take God's good gifts and to somehow make them about us. I can tell you that for the last week and a half, two weeks, I've been at a number of social, a number of social gatherings with y'all and almost inevitably fasting comes up in conversation. It's really interesting, a lot of us are into it, we're trying to figure it out, we're trying to, to use it, and by the way, I'm thankful for that, I think that's a beautiful gift, but I also wanna give us a little word of caution as we sit here halfway through this process, I, I wanna give us a little word of caution that we don't fall prey into mutating this good gift of God into an I'm better than you. Look at me, I'm holy. Matt, what'd you give up? Oh, you gave up peanuts? Well, I gave up chocolate, television. Basically, I'm not eating for 21 days. Look at me, look how holy I am and you're insignificant, Matt. Thanks though, I'm glad you're participating. Right? The goal of this is not a, goal, a game of comparison. It's not a game of I'm better than you. It's not uh, any of those things. It's not about us at all, except that we want to humble ourselves in the presence of the Lord, and we want to just simply sit and celebrate God's good gifts to us. We want to go where he wants us to go, where he is leading us. And, and we might not look stellar at the conclusion of that journey. 
We, we may not end up just going around the block and coming right back home. We might go on a wild, crazy, hard, challenging, difficult ride, but that's kind of the point, isn't it? Is to follow Jesus and his good gifts for us. Jesus says, listen, when you pray, don't just use a bunch of empty words that make you sound awesome. That's not the point. And when you fast, don't let everyone know you're fasting. Don't, don't promote it and beat your chest and say, look at me, I'm fasting, I'm fantastic. Because if we do that, we miss all of this. This is all about us acknowledging and seeking, questing, in fact, after the good things that God has for us in Christ Jesus. And can we agree that what God has for us in Christ Jesus is pretty fantastic? That's why this is in the center of the prayer, uh, of the sermon. That's why this is in the center of the Sermon on the Mount, because it should be central to the way that we work out both ends of the Sermon on the Mount. It should be central to the way that we respond to everyone, seeking reconciliation and grace and mercy and hospitality and care and generosity. And all of these things are centered on the fact that God gives us both of these good gifts, prayer and fasting, so that they become who we are as we live outward to others. Because after all, we show our love for God in the way we show love for each other. That's actually how God works in the world. We show our love for God by the way that we love one another. That's his plan. We don't, we don't get to claim to love God and we get to hate our neighbor or badmouth our neighbor or talk smack about our neighbor. That's not how God works. We get to show our great love for God in response to his great love for us by how we love each other. It's central to the plan of God. Prayer and fasting are central to the plan of God. I, I don't want to lose this. Uh, our staff and I are excited that you guys are talking about this. Last week, we stood up and said, we have resources available, and I got ready to stand up at 1035 and say, we have resources available, and our staff is like, you can't say that, they're gone. That's cool, but let's not get lost in it. Let's not get lost in the thing so that we lose the purpose, because the purpose is simply this. We want you to sit at the feet of Jesus every day, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and whomever you're with, and allow his promises to actually shape the way you live. Tracking? Last thing. I have two great hopes for today. I'm going to be very upfront with both of them. I have two great hopes for today. First one, you know, it's that the Packers knock off the 49ers. <laughs> That's my great hope for the day. And my second great hope is even more significant than that, and that is that we will commit as God's people to anchoring ourselves in this quest of prayer shaped by the teachings of Jesus that we will seek God's kingdom and God's will and God's purpose, that we will seek to make his name great because that's the point of all of this. Listen, Chiefs fans, God will show you grace today too like he did last week. <laughs> that's my prayer for you all today is that we take God at his word and we seek to honor our Father who is in heaven. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, thanks for being you. Thanks for being gracious and merciful. Thanks for loving us in Christ Jesus. For, for teaching us to pray in such a way that it pushes us beyond ourselves and our interests and our desire to guard our reputations and to look good. God, thanks for anchoring us in the gospel, this news that your son Jesus came and dwelt among us and lived and died so that we might have life and was raised from the dead so that we would know that that is our hope, that you will return again and we will live with you forever. God, thanks for teaching us to pray. Thanks for reminding us that your good gifts are not designed 
to make us look good, but designed that your name might be hallowed, might be made holy, might be celebrated among your people, and ultimately among all of creation. Jesus, we love you. But more importantly, and most importantly, in fact, we know that you love us. We pray all this in your name and all God's people said, amen. amen.